Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to give a welcoming to Mount Sachs Black History Month luncheon. This is a, a, a critical time for our nation and particularly for Black America. You know, we write history on a day by day basis. So how will history remember this period of time? Will it be remembered at a time in the, in the greatest health crisis the nation has never ever known that we denied health care to black Americans who died at a higher rate than any other group? Will history remember this time as a period in which our legal system incarcerated more black men than any other group, ignoring the fact that our crime rate continued to escalate to a rate higher than in the last 40 years. Will history remember this time in, in which the, the richest and, and most privileged were the ones who gained in the economic recovery become even richer? Or even, even though during this period of time, those um, minoritized groups uh, in, increased in joblessness and homelessness during this period of, of greatest American riches. Well, what is Mount Sac going to be remembered as? I, I would hope that we would be remembered as a corner of this world that called out those injustices and in fact looked at our own house to say, are we improving equitable outcomes for all students and particularly those who have been denied access to education in their life experiences? Will we be known as a leader in equity, diversity, inclusion, racial justice and anti-racism? Or will Mount SAC be remembered as another organization that just was apathetic and continued its practices of institutional racism. I can tell you that as your leader, I am committed to calling out injustice wherever it occurs and fighting it. And particularly in this corner of the world for Mount SAC, in, in, with our influence in our region, with our students, with the next generation that's gonna write that history, that Mount SAC will contribute to the future of our democracy to have an educated electorate and a strong voice day by day on campus, in our classrooms, in our counseling offices, in our public forums, to be sure that the history that's written for Mount Sac and the history that's written for America is one of equity, diversity, inclusion, social justice, and anti-racism. Have a great luncheon today. And drop by and see me sometime. I have open office hours all the time. I'd love to hear your view on these issues. Take care. Bye. Let freedom ring. Let freedom ring. Oh, ring from the hills to the valleys. Let freedom. Freedom, bring, bring, bring that freedom, bring, bring, bring that 
freedom ring, ring, let 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 freedom ring, let freedom ring, let freedom ring, ring, let freedom ring, ring, let freedom Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the Emoja Aspire program at Mount San Antonio College for our Black History Month address. My name is Clarence Banks, and I serve as the director of the Emoja Aspire program and the Center for Black Cultural and Student Success. I would like to thank Dr. Scroggins for beginning our program with the campus welcome, and our Mount Sac Chamber Singers and the Aeolians of Oakwood University for their collaboration, Let Freedom Ring. For 11 years, the Emotion Aspire program has led the campus efforts to recognize the achievements of Black people in the United States and throughout the entire diaspora. Many of you have joined us in the past for our Black History Month luncheon. We are grateful that you have decided to join us today in our virtual environment. The Black History Month address would not be possible without the financial support of Associated Students and the Office of the President. We are also thankful for the continuous support from our Board of Trustees, students, faculty, staff, and managers. There are two questions that I am asked often. What are the origins of Black History Month? And why is Black History Month celebrated in February? Black History Month began as Negro History Week in 1926 in the United States by historian Carter G. Woodson. Dr. Woodson and the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History announced the second week of February to be Negro History Week. This week was chosen because it coincided with the birthday of Abraham Lincoln on February 12th and of Frederick Douglass on February 20th both of which dates Black communities had celebrated together since the late 19th century. At the time of Negro History Week's launch, Woodson contended that the teaching of Black history was essential to ensure the physical and intellectual survival of the race within broader society. He stated, if a race has no history, it has no worthwhile tradition. It becomes a negligible factor in the thought of the world, and it stands in danger of being exterminated. Black History Month was first proposed by Black educators uh, and uh, Black uh, United students at Kent State University in February 1969. The first celebration of Black History Month took place at Kent State one year later in 1970. In 1976, President Gerald Ford recognized Black History Month during the celebration of the United States Bicentennial. He urged Americans to seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishments 
of Black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history. Today, Black History Month is celebrated in the month of February in the United States and Canada, and October in Ireland, the Netherlands, and the United Kingdom. Black History Month is not only about our past, but also our present and our future. At this time, I would like to introduce a young man who embodies our future, Mr. Favor Onyese. Favor is a champion on our campus forensics team. He will be performing an original piece entitled The Conspiracy Against Hip Hop. Please welcome Favor to our virtual stage. Back in the spring of 2012, someone composed the message with the subject line, the secret meeting, that had changed rap music and destroyed a generation. That unsigned letter claimed that in the 1990s, a secret meeting had joined two of America's most powerful forces, the music industry and the prison industrial complex. I have a very exciting opportunity for you all. Your companies have invested billions of dollars into privately owned prisons, and your positions of power in the music industry could actually impact the profitability of these investments. Your job, marketing music that influences criminal behavior, and rap music, <laughs> that is the music of choice. Whoop, whoop, that's the sound of the police. Are you familiar with this letter? Do you believe there's any truth behind these meetings? Do you? entertain conspiracy theories? I don't think there's shoot behind it. No, even soul music can make you do some things. If you're sad, what's that song? Ooh, child, things are gonna get easier. That'll make you do some things. Just being in the hood is a setup for jail. Whoop, whoop, that's the sound of the police, whoop. This is an ode to the boys who died to make hip hop happen. For black people, these conspiracy theories that explain our mistreatment have continuously ended up being true. From the Tuskegee syphilis study, to forced sterilizations, and the loopholes of the 13th Amendment. Because black people feel like they cannot rely on the system, their skepticism continues with the recent events of the COVID-19 vaccines nonetheless. It's not shocking to see black people mistrusting a government that has historically abused them. The hip hop conspiracy theory is yet another unfortunate event where this very possibility seems to be very feasible. Imagine if we were getting proven that we were getting microchipped by the vaccine or that your everyday pigeon was actually a surveillance camera watching your every move. This thought experiment gives non-black folks some insight into the black experience. Using the following drama, The Conspiracy Against Hip Hop by NPR, Testimonies of Killer Mike and Too Short by Rodney Carmichael and Sidney Madden, lyrics by Dr. Dre, Grandmaster Flash, KRS-One, and Ice Cube, and poetry, Ode to the Boys Who Died and Make Hip Hop Happen by Stephen Willis. Whether this conspiracy theory is true or not doesn't matter. The Dialogue behind these conspiracy theories are grounded in our real lived experiences and are a clear reflection of our fear and reality. Ricka Ricka can't take the smell, can't take the noise, got a money to move out, I guess I got no choice. When the message was released in 1982, there are a little over 400,000 people incarcerated in America. That's only a fraction of what it is today. Ricka Ricka don't push me, cause I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. Later that same year, Ronald Reagan launched a war on drugs that America has never seen before, increasing the federal prison population to 76% in just seven years. 84, 85, 86, even 87, cops with guys in blue uniforms. You know, they would talk to you first, give you a stern talking to. 
I shot a bird at a cop once. They took me to their car and put me to my father, whom I had a very stern talking to at home. By the time you reach 88, 89, even 90, cops went from not downright Mayberry, but still homey enough to give you a stern talking to, still taking you home, turn to units. Like the Red Dog unit that dressed up in red paramilitary forces. And their game was to hunt before this poem ends. <laughs> this wound will drain and expand. And my ceased heartbeat will bleed into an instrumental. Shame. I had to die in order to get my life back on track. Whether this meeting happened or not is not what this is about. But the hype around this letter, fake news or not, really tells us of the fear and paranoia of how the criminal justice system disproportionately affects black people in this country is very real. What I learned from my father was that gangster rap wasn't, it was a product of the drug war. A reaction to mass incarceration, not the other way around. Well, when music started to reproduce these stereotypes, it became an easy sale for white America. And that meant selling records by the million. I expand. The ops caught me hanging off the nine and click, click, bang, bang. I was Chief Keith ad libs into the afterlife. But ain't that your favorite part of the song? Ricka, ricka, bow, wow, wow, you be oh, you be a, that throws in the motherfucking house. In the 90s, gangster rap was exploding at the same time as the term super predator was hitting headlines. Rick a rick a motherfucking billboard editor, here comes the predator. Later then, Senator Joe Biden said this, We must take back the streets from these super predators. And you take back the streets with more cops, more prisons, and more physical protection for the people. Even Barry Wise, label executive Too Short, said this, You know Too Short? Death Row, Snoop Dogg. They kind of doing your style better than you. They're more successful than you because they're not holding back. You should just drop a dirty fucking album. Today, there are more than 2.2 million people locked up. And about a third of them are black. Now keep in mind that black people only make up 13% of this country's population. So this entire time, mass media has been getting rich feeling off these perceptions. You get big business people involved, and whatever they think is going to make them more money is not necessarily for the benefit of the art form or the people making the art form. So even if this letter is fabricated, then tell me, where's the lie? If you listen closely, you can hear my body drop before the beat does. And no, we never intended to be the muses to the world's most popular music, but here I am now, God! Sacrifice for the culture. To be forever late to rest in a cassette colored casket. Oh, I can hear it now. My demise is going to be the most requested at all the parties. Tell Big Mama her baby boy's got his own hymn now. Sip the liquor. I know a bar. <laughs> and that's not no record scratch. No, that's me trying to rick a rick come off this casket, trying to rick a rick unzip this body bag and join Nipsey. I can hear him celebrating me because I can hear them say that I'm a hit, I'm a hit, I'm a hit, I'm a hit, I'm hit, I'm hit, I'm hit, I'm I'm What I can tell you is most conspiracy theories are believable. And the reason I say that is because all this business is attached. The same companies that own one thing are often conglomerous in owning others. Now, when you hear me say that, you might think, oh, that sounds ridiculous. What's not ridiculous is we know if a child is not reading by the third grade, they are more than likely to end up going into prison. And that's not a conspiracy theory. So can I believe that this conspiracy theory is true? Yeah. 
Because in every other hell is true. If you look at healthcare, we're underserved. If you look at education, we're underserved. You get what I'm saying? The question for me comes in America, why are we so in an uproar about the Second Amendment and never the 13th? You get what I'm saying? Like, why have we not talked about the fact that slavery is still legal? And because slavery is still legal, is the need to fill the void of slaves. So yeah, I believe in any conspiracy theory that puts poor people into jail because there's a profit margin to be made. It's not whether or not that I can believe it, it's look at the proofs in the pudding. Look at what we see. So the question is now, what are we going to do about it? And that was my presentation. My name is Faye Ronyasso. I am from the Mount Sac Forensics Department, and I thank you all for listening. Thank you, Favor, for that outstanding performance. I believe I speak for everyone that that was truly heart touching, um, emotional, and truth. And that's the reason why we must have students involved with all of our programs because they will always give us the truth and bring us back to our mission. So Favor, thank you for being a true artist and being a true scholar. At this time, I would like all of you to join me in observing a moment of silence. Oftentimes, Black stories and stories about Black lives and experiences are silenced. Silenced in the media, silenced in the classroom, silenced in the courtroom, silenced in the court of public opinion. So today, we want to take a moment to reflect on the names and lives of the unspoken. A moment of silence for all of the Black people who have lost their lives in the struggle for freedom. Dr. King, Malcolm X, Fred Hampton, those who have lost their lives as a result of racial violence and discrimination, Breonna Taylor, Sandra Bland, George Floyd, and for those future heroes who would dedicate their lives to freedom and justice. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Now we will have another performance by our Mount Sac chamber singers led by the legendary director, our very own Professor Bruce Rogers. Save her name. 
I want to thank Bruce Rogers and the Mousesack Chamber Singers for their timely performance of Say Her Name. The last few years have been very turbulent for Black people in America. So the Most Aspire program sought to find a theme for today's address that was timely and appropriate. The theme for this year's program, Where Do We Go From Here?, was inspired by the 1967 book of the same title by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And where do we go from here? Dr. King challenges us to move beyond kind words and statements of solidarity to meaningful action. 55 years later, Mount San Antonio College in particular and our nation in general find ourselves asking a similar question. Where do we go from here? In regard to faculty hiring, where do we go from here? In regard to the treatment of our students, where do we go from here? In regard to eliminating success gaps, where do we go from here? In our desire to move towards true social justice, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here is a challenging question. This is the challenge that we presented to our guest speaker. And we believe this phenomenal woman is equal to the task. It is my pleasure to introduce the woman who will deliver our Black History Month address. Dr. Regina Stanback Stroud is an anti-racist activist and committed practitioner who has dedicated 35 years of her life's work to higher education, serving as a California Community College Chancellor, President, Vice President of Instruction, Dean, and Professor of Nursing. Dr. Stanback Stroud is highly regarded for her work on student equity and diversity, economic empowerment, and anti-poverty strategies. Dr. Stanback Stroud served as a local academic Senate President and as President of the state Academic Senate for California Community Colleges. Dr. Stanback Stroud served as a presidential appointee on the President's Advisory Council on Financial Capability for Young Americans for President Barack Obama. In recognition of her work on equity, the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges established the Regina Stanback Stroud Diversity Award. In recognition of her leadership, the Western Regional Council on Black American Affairs established the Dr. Regina Stanback Stroud Leadership Achievement Award. Dr. Stanback Stroud also has served as a visiting assistant professor and adjunct professor in the Mills College and San Francisco State University Educational Leadership Doctoral Programs, respectively. Her areas of scholarship include the intersection of critical race theory, Black feminist thought, and women's leadership. Her published works are on women of color and leadership, workforce and economic development, and anti-poverty strategies in the community colleges. She holds a doctorate and master's degree in educational leadership from Mills College, a master's degree in human relations from Golden Gate University, and a bachelor's degree in nursing sciences from Howard University in Washington, DC. It is an honor to welcome Dr. Regina Stanback Stroud to deliver our Black History Month address. Dr. Regina Stanback Stroud, the virtual stage is yours. Well, thank you so much. First of all, how absolutely powerful an introduction and a framing, how meaningful the comments that range from your leadership to the student performance to the performance of the chamber. And as from whence I come, we don't start a conversation or a celebration of Black history without acknowledging that we lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty and we let our rejoicing rise high as the glistening skies and let it resound loud as the roaring seas. Now I so badly wanted to sing that for you, but when I showed the preacher how I sing, cause I said I wanted to be in choir, he told me that the Lord needed ushers. So I thought I would spare you, but acknowledge the Negro National Anthem. 
Now, let me start these remarks with a land acknowledgement that this land that you work on and study on, and that quite frankly, have a sense of entitlement because you possess it, was under the stewardship of the Gabrielino Tongva tribe. And if you look at the college history, even on the website, it has a very sanitized statement that says, before Mount San Antonio College came to be, just came to be, the land was inhabited by the Gabrielino Tongva tribe, Indian tribe, until Spanish explorers and pioneers, settlers called it home. But see, I, I, I understand, and because we're talking about history, that that's a sanitized version, because that is how history is taught in these United States. So let's be clear. The so-called settlers and pioneer explorers just didn't show up and call it home. They committed murder and genocide. They dispossessed a nation of people of their land, liberty, life and then revise the story to give it some dignity historically or just to by just passively calling it home. And I wanna begin my remarks with the acknowledgement that because we celebrate African-American heritage, black history, we know that our histories and our stories and our lives are inextricably linked and that we love this nation enough to help it be honest with itself. So I would like to offer my deep gratitude to Professor Clarence Banks, to Mount San Antonio College for extending this invitation to me. I wanna thank my good friend and colleague, Dr. Bill Scroggins, not only for supporting Professor Banks in his efforts to get me here, but for the equity-minded leadership that it takes to mobilize resources and create this type of space in our academies to engage such important discussions around one of the most complex, nuanced issues over the last several centuries. And it's a space that is not always so comfortable. You see, none of us are as racially literate or culturally fluent as we wanna be. We're gonna get it wrong sometimes. We're gonna make mistakes and we have to give each other permission to be imperfect. And newsflash, for people of color in the room, though it's informed by our racial, by our lived experiences, our racial literacy is not derived from the content of the melanin in our skin. And for people who classify themselves as white, as Robin D'Angelo says, nothing in the dominant culture gives you the information you need to have an informed opinion on one of the most complex, nuanced social dilemmas for the last several hundred years. Thank you to Dr. Banks and the Umoja program. Brandon, go to the next slide, please, for welcoming me here. And speaking of history, we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge that there are at least, that we're on the precipice of legally sanctioning speech, particularly around race. Uh, it is an exercise in the ultimate revisionism of history. We, have, we seem to have a history that's so shameful that people in powerful positions don't want it taught to, the, taught to the extent of being willing to legislate what is included and excluded. Where, where more than half the states in the nation are literally legislating what will be taught, how it will be taught, whether you can say certain things. The, in other words, if, you, if it is preventing the teaching of the legally sanctioned oppression and violence and vitriol that has been exacted against people of color with a particular focus on the teaching of the horrors of enslavement of black people. And it's reduced to the conversation about just look, are we just focusing on a little bit too much on our historical mistakes? The problem is that these are not historical mistakes. Our factual, indisputable history is filled with intentional and deliberate oppression, marginalization, exclusion, and violence specifically levied against Black lives and Black bodies with the intended purpose of dehumanization. And that's necessary for the justification 
of the inconcurrency of our articulated values and our actions, our values of equality and liberty and pursuit of happiness. So much of the language is aimed at protecting that racial fragility, you see, because until recently, many white people didn't have to contemplate their own racial identity. They were only racialized in the context as juxtaposed to others who were quote unquote minoritized, even though nine tenths of the people of the world are people of color. And so there is actual language in this legislation now that prohibits the teaching of anything that would make somebody even feel that they bear responsibilities for actions in the past or language that says one group is inherently racist or language that 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 says you know the meritocracy and those 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 ideals are inherently racist or in other words language that doesn't give a teaching that doesn't give an alternate perspective you know so if you're going to teach about the holocaust yes it was atrocious but you know isn't there another way of looking at the killing of six million people because of their race or if you're going to teach about enslavement and kidnapping and brutalization of 100 million people, isn't there another point of view to teach? In other words, it's illegal for you not to teach another point of view in some of the states right now in these United States. And this debate is grounded on centuries of pseudo-scientific hierarchization of the stroke social construction of race. And as I mentioned, it has centuries long efforts of putting into place structures that impact virtually every societal system that is designed to get inequitable results that privilege and benefit the white collective and harm and disadvantage black people. Be it societal systems such as finance, housing, the economy, employment, the criminal justice system with mass communication, and yes, education. Go to the next slide, please. And so I do get things that say, yeah, but Regina, wasn't it so long ago? And I so wish I could give you the credit for this image. I don't know it or have it. It actually comes off of a t-shirt, but it is so apt. Uh, I just wanna you know, uh, go on record to say it is not my academic uh, property or intellectual property, but giving credit to whomever created it. I didn't want to miss the opportunity to use it to say, it is so apt to be able to answer the question, yeah, Regina, but wasn't that a long time ago? Or well, as my brother-in-law who said to me, he's white, he lives in Kentucky. And he, you know, when we talked about slavery, he said, well, there's some people that would just tell you to get over it. Well, you know, he's not with us anymore. No, I'm kidding, I, le I let him live. <laughs> And that, that's because of the false notion that, you know, this was really a long time ago. We have moved past that. I mean, aren't we in a post-racial society now? I mean, after all, Obama was president, okay? But what, if you look at the graphic and depiction of how long we've been in this, we have had centuries of this legally sanctioned oppression. And as a matter of fact, the teaching of this is in, inherently in the 1619 Project which is something that is targeted to not be taught in American school systems, in half of the states in the nation. And then we have continued work of legally sanctioned segregation, which is still the, the praxis, the practice, the application of white supremacy. And then just recently, as you look with the beginning of the civil rights era in 1954 on into um, 2000, you can see where we might have this consciousness um, that we have. Uh, so we are up against a few years. We are at work of a few years of trying to be up against centuries long work to maintain these systems. And quite frankly, colleges and universities are not exempt. Colleges and universities all over the nation are part of an educational system that are replete with structural racism and they have the outcomes to prove it. They have outcomes and student experiences that can be predicted by race. And unless you believe that that student's experience and that student's outcome is a consequence of their genetics, then you have to recognize it is a consequence of the structure that produces that outcome. And that's why Ijeoma Oluo says in her book, so you wanna talk about race, 
she says, you cannot have a nation that is founded on the genocide of a nation of people and built on the chattel enslavement of a group of people and think that it's not about race. So that's when people say, well, you know, is it always about Regina? Regina, is it always about race? Why does it always have to be about race? As long as this nation exists, it is about race and the structures in place to explicitly benefit white people and to maintain a social order that sees to that benefit in multiple domains. So this address ushers in the celebration of African-American Heritage Month, Black history by being centered on race. We are intentional. And indeed, it is to understand and to disrupt the anti-Black foundations of the academy. And it may not be the intentional anti-Black foundations for current day, because we cannot subscribe to that ideology, but still have the benefit of that ideology and ha still have the impact of that ideology that produces these results. Because you see, the ideology of white supremacy is so ingrained in our psyche and our systems and our structures in society that the centrality and the superiority of whiteness is established as neutral. It is visible, invisible to the naked eye. And we have contemporary code words for it. We say things like, well, these are, we, we're not gonna lower our standards. This is academic integrity. This is academic excellence. This is rigor. We have narratives that say, you know, you need to have that grit and that mindset because it just takes hard work and determination and that grit and growth mindset to get through, you know, that, that to, be, to have tenacity when you're faced with those barriers, to have resilience. Don't let a little thing stop you that, that uh, in a system, in a system that drills into students' heads, their utter worthlessness and lack of humanity. You don't have to tell black and brown students to have grit. They encounter and overcome setbacks and issues and barriers that most of us could not imagine encountering. And that's just on their way to your class or to your office or to your desk or to your service. And then we create other systems and barriers and put in front of them and then cheer them on and say, stick to it, you can overcome this. And then we celebrate that miraculous overcoming uh, of the few percentages that get through. We make this stuff up as educators. I'm just telling you that right now. We have academic traditions and habits and practices and policies to ensure that the status quo of inequity continues no matter how blatantly racist it's revealed to be. Don't believe me, just take a look at, for an example, the conversation around 705. There are a lot of good, well-meaning people that are on both sides of that issue. But we know very well that for decades, we have had placement policies where we made up the stuff. Some people can retake the placement test in a year. Some people can retake it next week. Some people can't retake it at all. You get locked into this sequence of basic skills. And we know that students are coming from literature-based English classes to take a grammar-based placement test to be placed in a composition-based English class. And we know it has nothing to do, no prediction, predictability on that student's likely success. Yet we relegated thousands and thousands and thousands of students to these basic skills sequences that kept them from the degree. So it gets manifested in those outcomes. And, that, and, and, and my comments about that is not that necessarily, um, is not an argument about one side or the other of 705. It is that we put energy into trying to figure out the workarounds as opposed to putting energy into trying to figure out the structure and the system that would support that success. So we have to be careful about that. And when it's blatantly revealed to us to reveal these inequities, then what do we want to do about that? Where do we go from here? We have the opportunity to consider this momentum right now and this consciousness and curiosity and disrupt the anti-Blackness in the academy that's manifested in these disparities in hiring, completion, retention, persistence, transfer, promotions, you know, because the conditions of Black people and Black students and staff and faculty and administrators and communities often are manifested with differences or disparities in experiences. Go to the next slide for me, please, Brandon. So when we say that there's, a stru there's structural racism embedded in the academy, 
in our academy understand that this is not an accusation of individual individual having some individuals having a sentiment about a group of people. We're talking about those sentiments being reinforced by systems of power, like the judicial system, the economic system, religious systems, educational systems. And though we're in the time of a pandemic, if we're really honest, this is an endemic now, we're gonna live with this. We know that long before there was a health pandemic, there existed a pandemic of anti-Black racism and that it was exacting an unrelenting form of violence and brutality and destruction against Black lives and Black bodies. And yet again, that yet again required Black people and their accomplices and allies to simply state their humanity, ranging from Sojourner Truth saying, ain't I a woman, to the civil rights era saying, I am a man, to current and contemporary conversations that say Black lives matter. And trust me, that pandemic did not stop at the thresholds of the doors of the academy. Indeed, it was maintained and perpetuated by the very existence and purpose and impact of the academy, if you, if you uh, consider what Carter G. Woodson says. And unless we are intentionally working to deconstruct the racist systems, as Dr. Kendi puts it, you can't just not be not racist, you have to be anti-racist, then we will continue to create the spaces where inequity exists. And we will not be able to disrupt spaces or create spaces where equity cannot thrive and we get the outcomes and experiences that are not predictable by race. But we can reconceptualize this issue in the academy. Instead of asking why are there just so few black people available to teach, black and brown people to teach in our, on our faculty, we have to ask ourselves, what is it about our practices, processes, procedures? What is it about our descriptions? What is it about our processes that systemically excludes black and brown people? Instead of asking and considering, why can't these students make it in our class? Why aren't they doing well in calculus and physics and English and math and sociology? Why are, why are they just, why are they not passing? Why is there a gap, right? Instead of asking that, ask the question of why are we so consistently incapable and unsuccessful in teaching the same group of students over and over again? Why is it that we consistently are not successful and teaching black and brown students, because we know that we can teach. We know that we can serve. We can know that we can provide administrative leadership. We know that we can do this because we do it so well and get the results that produce successful white and Asian students. So we know we can do it, but we're not able to do it with black students. And so if you ask, why is it that we can't pass as educators? That is a reconceptualization of the issue doesn't mean that there aren't real issues with the students, but it means it's an opportunity for us to think about it differently and to have to round out some of our solutions that just don't work on creating, addressing the deficiencies of the student, but instead address on addressing any of the deficiencies of the institution, our practices, processes, procedures, our pedagogy, our curriculum, our strategies. And what I'm talking about here is the centrality of whiteness in the academy that makes it so normal that we come to work every day, we can collect our salaries and over decades, see these disparities and think and just have business as usual. Because I actually believe if some of the results that we see with let's say black and uh, black students um, were the, if we inversed it and said that these are the results of white students uh, and the gaps existed, the disparities existed, and the inverse, I believe across this nation, we would be in a state of emergency, that there would be no business as usual, and we would stop and revamp this entire educational system. If white males were more likely to go to jail than to go to college, there would be a new day in America. I believe that. But because we see this condition as normal because we justify it thinking that it's normal because of the race and the experience and the culture and the community of the student. We're able to continue on, say how great we are with those kinds of results. And by the way, those results are not available to the public at Mount SAC. If you wanna get student outcome data, you have to have a login to get in. So the public may not know those things. Oh, I shouldn't say it like that. It might be that they're available, but this public didn't know how to access it uh, and really did a lot of work, ultimately ended up going to a nationwide iPads data 
to get some information. Now, why are we able to do that? Why are we able to have this normalcy, even though the disparities are right there? Well, we justify it in four ways. Eduardo Bonilla Silva says we use abstract liberalism, naturalization, cultural racism, and minimization of racism. Abstract liberalism we, is you know, where we have these, these features of individualism and universalism and egalitarianism and meliorism. In other words, you know, we create, we, we promote and inculcate white, uh, white normative values. Naturalization is, well, you know, well, the, you know, they all want to be together. It's just a matter of taste and fit, you know, in terms of figuring out who's going to be on this faculty or not. It's just not a good fit, you know. Uh, so, so it, it's it's primarily people want to associate with people that they have things in common with. And then we use cultural racism, where we say, well, you know, they don't really value education, but they just want their girls to get married. I mean, and they, you know, they have a lot of children. They don't have the same morality. They don't believe in hard work. They prefer a handout. And then we use the minimization of racism that says, well, you know, that was a long time ago. I mean, after all, Regina, you know, wasn't Obama the president. Come on, come on. Why is it always about race? So those are the strategies that we use to make ourselves comfortable in being able to look at those results day in and day out and continue to do the same things that we do in our institutions year in and year out. We go to the next one, please, Brandon. And that is because the shapers of the policies of higher education, who gets in, who places where, who has the aptitude and the ability, who is deserving, the shapers have the systems set up that are grounded in white supremacy. Now, the whole notion of white supremacy, I'm not trying to be polemical when I'm talking like that. It is that, that it actually was a notion. We had American Eugenics Society and the people who were the founders of many of our educational processes and our systems, our testing, the people who the father, grand, the father of the SAT, the, the architect of the uh, educational testing services that we use right now today. So, so these are people who were very active in the eugenicist movement. Uh, and at that time, they didn't know to be ashamed of that. So the American Eugenics Society was very prominent. It had the credibility of you know, prominent institutions. There was uh, Stanford University, Carl Brigham, president of Stanford University, used Stanford to give it kind of some, some credibility. And so there was this form of pseudoscience that was done in order to have the, the creation of the creation of race as a social construction. And so we we end up with all of these people who had a lot of impact on the, the creation and the establishment of our educational system in this nation, doing it from a framework of American eugenics, of, of the uh, eugenics society. And it was only with the increased consciousness or information around that being the underlying ideolo ideological perspective that justified the Holocaust, did there start to be a movement away from eugenics and a recognition or an acknowledgement that look, this is pseudoscience. This is not real. You know, the measuring of skulls and using our white male bodies as the examples of perfection um, in order to hierarchize race is not real. It's a social construction. We could have made race out of the length of your, your baby finger and then created a racial category. It, it's not real, it's not biological. Next one, please. So to the students, I want you to humor me a little bit. I want you to imagine arriving at a place where your race and your culture is affirmed every day, where the institution and its faculty consciously and subconsciously support your well being without even having to think about it, where you're comfortable racially every day, all day, where the centrality and normativity of your race is so ingrained in the academy that it is neutral and invisible to the naked eye. It just is. Where you're taught from the first day of your formal education of the superior contributions of your people. Where they have made contributions to literature, science, technology, philosophy, fine arts, creative arts, business, so much more where the way you speak is valued and, and considered common and considered to be the standard for communication and where your natural 
physical characteristics are considered the standard of beauty, excellence, dignity, and grace, where you represent the essence of goodness and virtuosity and integrity and industry. Imagine that it defines you and all you represent as that goodness. Because if that's the message that you can get from cradle to grave, from your family and your neighborhood and from the educational system, from the media, from your workspace, the places that you study and you live and you learn and you love and you marry and even the places that you die, then where would you be and where do you go from there? To the educators that serve students, where you go depends on, where you go from here depends on where here is. What students need is belonging, validation, support networks, cultural affirmation. Because research shows that when whiteness is deeply embedded in higher education institutions, it significantly disadvantages racialized minoritized students. This work that Ben Simone did, Dowd and Ben Simone uh, did as well, because there can be a cultural dissonance. So they need belonging. There's a recent article that was published by uh, Nick Morrison in Forbes that said, if you want black students to do well at school, it helps if you're positive about black students. It showed that when you were positive about black students, they not only had good grades that year, but they had good grades uh, years out. It had, they have a greater sense of belonging and schools acted as an agent of positive cultural socialization. And you can't leave it all just to the Umoja program to create that belonging. It has to be something that the entire institution is responsible for. Understanding that students are pro-social academic learners. Uh, and you know, examine our practices in the classrooms because for an example, pro-social learners is incongruent or inconsistent with the typical value that is, uh, uh, value that is uh, uplifted in classrooms, which is individualism and um, uh, competitiveness, okay? Um, we also have to make sure that you develop and have strong relationships between positive relationships between faculty and with students. That impacts their experiences as well. Encourage the students to study together as opposed to criminalizing and suggesting that, you know, it might be, there might be some cheating. Encourage, you know, really build on that work that you do of collaborative learning. And validate their positive experiences, validate their work. You know, a lot of times when we're talking about the accomplishments of, you know, black and brown students, we're usually talking about it in some heroic, mir miraculous thing that happened as a result of overcoming all of these barriers. And Asa Hilliard actually wrote some work on that, that we have, to we have to believe in the genius that is before us in our classrooms, at our desk, in our service areas. And we have to support that genius and then make sure that they have the kind of support networks that exist. Um, there's a lot of work, you see a lot of work on the black male initiatives, for an example, that are creating these networks and really seeing the impact of some of the work that is uh, being done and the, the effects of those networks. Go to the next one. So when we think about where do we go from here, let's see here. Oh, hold on a second. Okay. So when we think about what are some of the things that we can do, let's take, take a look at uh, Professor Banks mentioned it in the beginning. Dr. Scroggins mentioned something about it. And I'm gonna mention something about it because one of the things that we do know through studies is that students who have access to a diverse faculty do well, do better. Uh, and there was a very seminal study that was done out of Foothill De Anza that showed that and it's not just black students do well, but all students do well. And all students actually indicated that they have a preference you know, for a diverse faculty. Now this information is, is five years old, this data right here is five years old. But it's actually pretty accurate, give or take a few percentages. So you have Latinx students now make up 64%, I think. And I got that from your, from some, some of the data that's available. Um, not 53%, but the faculty, Latinx faculty only make up 
uh, 18%. And I also want to acknowledge that I realize that there are lots of different ways in which we can represent Latinx. I'm using Latinx as uh, just simply uh, identifying that there is a change, there, there are different terms in terms of um, masculine and feminine, but I could say ch Chicanx, I could say Chicano, Mexican American, Hispanic, Latinx, etc. So thank you for allowing me to abbreviate it. I just didn't want to um, give you the impression that I didn't have some consciousness around that. And different people identify in different ways. Um, Asian students make up 18%, not 21% now, uh, but the faculty make up 13%. White students make up 9%, yet the faculty make up 54% now, 54%. And if you look at the people who are in the pipeline, again, overwhelmingly white to become uh, the a faculty. And if you look at the people who have voice in governance, processes, practices, policies, pedagogy, meaning the academic senate, overwhelmingly white. And what that means is that you have, you know, doesn't make the people bad. It means that there is a centrality and normativity of whiteness in the academy and in the things that impact students' lives and impact whether they are successful or not. And it's not that you don't, that that, that is necessarily a bad thing. It's not that, that that is destructive or bad, it's just that absent diversity of perspective, it misses the mark in terms of how you might be able to serve students. And it creates the disparities in your outcomes. So, I wanted to be able to answer the question, where do you go from here? Where you go from here is you have to have efforts to dismantle that normativity through anti-racist education. And you are going to encounter intractable forms of resistance, even in the most progressive institutions. In other words, you can have all of those different things. You can have different events. You can have students, you can acknowledge, we can give the speeches, et cetera. We can all wear the, the name, put the signs up and wear the name patches and that kind of stuff. But the minute you try to interrupt the status quo of the structure, then that's a different conversation. I can recall being, uh, I was a college president and I was hiring faculty and I had about seven or eight different uh, positions. And what I noticed is about the fifth set of finalists that everybody that I was meeting would classify themselves as white. And so I said, hold it, stop, stop. What is it about our practices to systematically exclude women and people of color? I didn't call anybody racist. I said, what is it about our, our systems, our structure? And so I stopped hiring faculty and said I wasn't willing to hire faculty until we were able to examine our structures. Now, I'm going to tell you that you would have thought that I cooked the rabbit in the Glenn Close movie. People were upset. But we took that opportunity because I was clear that we wouldn't hire another faculty member until either I'm 96 years old or leave first, until we looked at our system to figure out what was producing these results. And what we found was that we were able to revamp our systems, have conversations, clarify how to err on the side of inclusivity, uh, debunk kind of the pseudoscience of the ranking of, I gave them a three because they said students six times. And I, well, I didn't give them a four on that because, you know, so we end up with these pseudoscientific, what we think is science, these, these ranking structures, et cetera, and ultimately have a lack of awareness around our own implicit biases. And we continue to produce the same results where we rehire ourselves. Well, that changed and we got outcomes that were phenomenal. We got a diverse faculty that was just esteemed and, and showed that it had an impact. And so it can be scary because you are interrupting or disrupting the status quo, but you have to have the courage to do so. It takes courage on the part of the leadership. You know, you have to be willing to, to be in these hard conversations. You will be attacked whether you are a faculty member that is articulating that view or whether you are a student, whether you're a classified professional or whether you are an administrator, you will be attacked. And we're not very practiced, particularly in the community college, the California community colleges. We engage in a lot of ad hominem. We dehumanize people because of the constituency that they're in, you know, and, you know, I, I, I did my fair share, you know, so it's, it's completely, it is completely part of the culture of our institution, but I'm conscious that when I'm talking to somebody, that that's somebody's mother, 
that's somebody's father, that's somebody's uncle, that's somebody's brother, that's somebody's sister. So I don't have to destroy the people because I disagree with their ideas. My goal is to make inequity enable to thrive in our institutions. So things you need to do, make yourself smarter, cultivate your racial literacy. You don't have the luxury of being clueless. Self-reflect on your positionality in the classroom. Don't necessarily value your own middle-class capital over that of the students. Recognize the brilliance that the students bring to you and they give you generous gifts every day when they open up to you. Recognize their non-dominant capital that they bring to the room. They are not your entertainment. They are, they are not there for you to save them. Um, so be careful of that, you know, that well-intentioned savior, savior complex that you're gonna help all these little brown and black people. We can learn so much more from students than we ever imagined. And understand that their habits and values may be different, uh, but they're not necessarily to be characterized as non-compliant. In other words, spontaneous, improvisational, exaggerated, expressive, and personalized, and even what may look to be argumentative and impulsive and, and um, uh, expressive is a form that our students bring to us to bring the learning alive. It might not be comfortable because that's not the way we were necessarily educated or that's not your cultural norm, but that's who you're teaching. And so get to understand from whence your students come as educators. And these remarks are not necessarily just dedicated or aimed or focused at faculty. This is all of our responsibility as classified professionals, as administrative leaders, and as faculty and then make the changes at the pace of those who need and want the change, not the resistors. In other words, don't prioritize your own comfort, your own racial comfort over the needs of the students. So whenever I say, whenever I hear things like, let's just take it slow, you know, you know um, we need to have adequate time, so we need two and a half semesters for everybody to have input, okay? In the meantime, generation after generation after generation of students are not served, are excluded. Go to the next one, please. And then to the young kings and queens that are in this room, that's the students. Oops, thank you. Did I miss one, Brandon? Yeah, thank you, thank you. To the, to the educators. Go to the next one, Brandon, I did that one. We just weren't on that slide, thank you. To the young kings and queens in the room. So let me just start right here. I'm a 65 year old black woman from the segregated South. So I will not leave you without reminding you that you need to be on a mission. That people have died so that you could be here, so that you could study, so that you could learn. So as we say at home, Get your books. First, give honor to the ancestors on whose shoulders you are standing to be here. Be on the mission, defy the stereotypes and the low expectations as Chadwick Boseman said to a 2018 Howard University graduating class, HU, you know, you are climbing an academic slope. He says that great struggle is required to achieve those degrees and enlightenment and you may have your own unique difficulties like academics. Some of it is financial, some of it is social, and some of it is psychological, but you are here. So when you can figure out where do we go from here, you are here. You are part of a system. You are in higher education. And you understand that there is an entire system that is constructed and funded to divert you from that being here, from the academy to incarceration. So the last thing you need to do is help them with that diversion. From the day you walk onto this campus or enroll or log on to that classroom, set your graduation date. At any time, I should be able to walk up to you and ask any student, when are you gonna graduate? And you should know the answer. Because if you haven't selected a graduation date, that means you're not working on graduating. 
and you likely will not graduate, whether it's graduate, complete, transfer, whatever your goal is. Pick a course of study. I know that in education, and this might be controversial for some educators, I know we're supposed to go, go into education and discover and explore and you know examine, et cetera. But you, we do not have time for you to find yourself. You are Black students in an American education system that has not been designed spe to specifically benefit you. So pick a course of study, study, progress, move forward. If you need to make some changes, make some changes but change while you're moving forward. In other words, we're walking, we're walking, we're walking. Learn the code, figure out different things, understand the system. You are, you are in the middle of something that you have to be able to dissect that code. Read that syllabus for real. Go to the office hours, access those resources, go to the counseling, use every single available resource that is, a, that is at that institution designed to support your success. Create networks with other students. Create relationships with faculty and staff. They love their disciplines. They love the institutions. They love the work that they do. They are committed. They can't wait to talk to you about it. These are people of influence and consequence all across the institution, whether they're at the welcoming desk in the admissions and records office or whether they are in a classroom teaching a class or whether they are in the uh, executive suite in, in the president's office. They want to be of service to you. They would be honored for you to exercise that self-agency that it takes and seek them out. They will go above and beyond for you. Take them up on it. As I often say, I know people in high places and low places and I love them all. So take them up on it. Get involved in student government so that black voices inform the allocation of resources and the priorities of the institution. Hold faculty and staff accountable for successfully teaching you. Ask for the success data. You see, there's about an 80, if you, if you see that there's a class, same class, same section, same level, same kinds of students, and you see consistently over here, 87% success rates in these areas, and over here, 27% success rates in those areas, I'm going to ask you, what, what statistical probability do you want in terms of your possible success? Interrogate the practices. Ask for the sources of authority. When somebody says, you know, they won't let us do that. We can't do that. They won't let us do that. Then you say, who is they? And let me speak to them. Call the institution on its promise to serve equitably, to equitably serve students. And ask why their definition of best and excellence gets manifested in overwhelmingly white faculty. Call on them to err on the side of inclusion. Ask to see program review data. Ask for data that's disaggregated by race. Follow the money. The student equity allocation for Mount SAC this year was $13 million. The general fund allocation is $176 million. Give or take some pennies, even $50,000 just for human resources diversity stuff, right? So we're talking about close to $200 million that are designed, that is aimed at your success, that the public has said, Take our most valuable assets, our money, our young minds, our working professionals, and, and live up to that mission that you have to empower and transform those lives. Ask for the impact of policies and procedures and ask for it disaggregated by race. Oh, we have that policy in terms of dropping class, dropping an individual if they have, you know, a $35, um, a $35 uh, balance on their account. Let me see who's, who's dropped and disaggregated by race. Oh, the things get turned over to a collection agency. Let me see who's turned over. Disaggregated by race. Ask those kinds of questions to help the institution serve you best because the institution wants to serve you best. Make no mistake about it. There is not an institution that is proud of the disparities, of the gaps, of the lack of student success. They are dedicating their life's work to success, to your success. So help them. Hold yourself accountable. There is nothing more beautiful than a mortarboard on, oh, which is a graduation cap, on your fro, your locks, your cornrows, your cut, your fade. Nothing more beautiful. And as Nina Simone said, oh, to be young, gifted, and Black. 
It is to know yourself, your people and your history and the majesty of from whence you come. Because as we as a people are down from kingdom, not up from slavery, your rightful place is on that throne of black excellence. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Regina Stanback Stroud for delivering such a dynamic address. I'm smiling because you did exactly what I knew you were going to do. And, and, and I'm so excited that, that our audience uh, has been able to, to hear um, your message, to hear your truth, and to see you answer the challenge of where do we go from here. Now, I know that your time is valuable. And I thank you for agreeing to answer questions from our Mount SAC community uh, to help facilitate the question and answer session. I'd like to welcome Dr. Mika Stewart to the program. Uh, Dr. Stewart is an instrumental faculty member helping to lead the campus equity initiatives. Uh, Dr. Stewart, thank you for joining us and uh, welcome to the virtual stage. Of course the phone rings right when I'm supposed to do this. Let me turn that off, I'm so sorry. All right, um, I just wanna say that I am just so stoked. That was so amazing. From the very beginning to, you know, starting with the Negro National Anthem and then moving to that land acknowledgement where you just, you just said it like it was, right? I mean, it wasn't just this like sweet thing. It was, you know, no, this was murder and genocide and dispossession and then sanitization. So I'm just like, yes, this was so good. And then you took us, you took us to our, our, our black royal and beautiful noble selves. That's where you ended. And so I'm just like, so pumped up. Um, so on that, I, I, I have collected some questions from faculty because we just want to glean all that we can from you. And so I'll just start with this kind of uh, just, um, just basic question. And it's, it's that your track record is amazing. You have held every position in academia from faculty to college president. Now you have your own business. What keeps you going? You know, what keeps you motivated? Because this is hard work. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And, and you know, that it is true that, you know, uh, as I say, you know, race work is hard work, but I don't have the luxury of, of relaxing. In other words, the, the mere survival, not just of black people, but of us as a society is dependent on us getting this right. One of the things that I say, particularly around Black History Month, is that it represents this long overdue affirmation and validation of black people and black culture and black humanity. And it's an opportunity for the white Republic to learn its history because black history is American history and is central to the survival of us as a people of this nation. And if we fail to recognize it, we fail at our own peril. So when we consider where we go from here, as you all asked me to consider that, you have to really kind of figure out where is, where is the here that we are talking about? And so when I look at the where the here is, uh, I, I don't know how not to be engaged. I can look at and see the kinds of outcomes that we have and the conversations that we're having in this academy and the, commit, the statements that are being made and the ideas that are being used to support our, our work and not push back against it so that we can be our best selves as educators. Because I, I will tell you that I, I fundamentally believe that we want to get it right. Yeah, we, yeah. We, I, I really do. I, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily, I don't judge. And, you know, that might be a function of age, you know, because when I was younger, you know, you couldn't tell me I wasn't Angela Davis, you know, so you say something wrong, I'm all in your stuff. All right. But I, but I actually think we have to have compassion around, it, you know, so that compassion, that belief, that aspiration Mm -hmm. and, and understanding my responsibility to the next, to the young people, to that young man that was there, to the young people uh, singing, my responsibility, understanding that, 
you that that gives you energy in of itself. It, it produces adrenaline like you wouldn't imagine. That's true. That is very true. And in fact, we do have many faculty here who are committed and are working. In fact, that's one of our questions. It's that faculty who are fighting the good fight, right, can easily find themselves overtaxed and worn down. How can the state and the institution, so like our lawmakers, deans, presidents, managers, policies, practices, and campus decision makers, support faculty and staff who go above and beyond to support students in campus social justice work in an effort for them to not feel so burned out. It's the same people, you know, it's the same people doing everything. So what, what, what can the yeah. college do? Yeah, yeah we, we, we understand that to be, you know, racial battle fatigue. But I wanna, you know, I'm gonna step, step back a little bit and um, just ask you to entertain this a little bit because uh, it might not feel good. You, you, you can't have your predominant question in the Black History Month conversation that's talking about the struggles and suffering of students and the systematic destruction of Black and Brown lives. Be centered on, well, what can we do to make faculty feel better? That can't be it. Now, it doesn't mean that that's not a legitimate question because you actually want those who are engaged to be able to do that good work. But do understand that the first question that you're asking me, aside from you know, what keeps me going, is how do we take care of faculty? By the way, how do we take care of your predominantly white faculty? All right? And it doesn't mean that people shouldn't be taken care of. And it doesn't mean that we don't have a responsibility to support their work uh, and to help them help us do what we want to do. But, but prioritize, prioritize the focus that you have. The first question has to be, how do we change it so that black students are successful? How do we change it so that we hire a diverse faculty? How do we change it so that they have different experiences? What can we do? What can the administration do to support that work so we can make those changes, right? That's a different, that's a different, from a different perspective. And in order to do that, they're gonna to have to support your work, right? I realize that that is, a, that's an uncomfortable answer uh, because I, uh, I understand the genesis of the question uh, and I don't have judgment around the question, uh, but we, we have to have that consciousness, that racial consciousness, mm -hmm. that the first question you asked me is how to take care of predominantly white group. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Y'all gonna be like, I ain't bringing her back here no more. <laughs> no, you that that we need you. This is what we need, right? So yes, all right. So um, well, let me go to the let me go to the next one, and this is gonna be another one that uh, you know you 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 get us on on the right track. Okay, what advice would you give to faculty who want to be more equitable and inclusive in their teaching? but are afraid to talk about race because they are afraid that they may say something wrong and unintentionally right. hurt a student or that's worse right. yet be labeled a racist. That's, that's right, that's right. And so, you know, that's exactly the, the issue that we have at hand. So first of all, a, a lot of times there is a conversation about, you know, we need to create safe spaces so that people, um, you know, are free to be able to do these types of things. Uh, so first I wanna make a distinction between safety and comfort. You're not safe if you're likely to, to, to be in a situation where you got stopped for a tail light and you did. That's, that's not safe. Or where you walk in or bird watching or barbecuing or driving or walking home with some Skittles and you're likely to be killed. Mm. High probability. That's not safe. Mm -hmm. The fact that somebody might think you're a racist, that's uncomfortable because we have this kind of unsophisticated notion of racism in our nation that says racism is about how one individual feels like an emotional thing. You know, that racism is about the structure. You don't have to be racist in order to have racist structures, right? That's discomfort. And so how do you deal with that discomfort? One, you know, take on the responsibility to become more racially literate. Just like when you are in your disciplines, 
and you want to know more about a particular phenomena or thing or construct or concept in your discipline, you study, you get articles, you go to conferences, you talk to, you know, other people in the community, those types of things. That's the same thing. Race, you know, the work that we do, racial literacy, that's a body of knowledge. I have a terminal degree in it and I'm still going to get it wrong. Right. So that's that's one thing. Um, and then understand, you know, many of us, you, we're in these positions. So, so for an example, faculty are in tenured positions that just simply means they have due process. Doesn't mean that they have lifetime employment. It means they have due process, right? But that due process does shield you a little bit to be able to have risky conversations. And you have to take those risks because the need or the desired outcome is more important than your comfort. You have to take those risks. You know, you're safe. It's just uncomfortable, right? So build networks around you to, to be able to mitigate that discomfort. Call on the leadership to create a culture and a climate to support you in creating a culture or climate where you can examine these things, uh, where you can have these conversations. Um, the the I, I, I completely get that, that it can be scary but you have to be bold, you have to be intentional, and you have to be unapologetic. Unapologetic. I am gonna get it wrong. I'm telling you, somebody can, somebody can punch holes all through the stuff that I do. I am unapologetic about this stuff. Now, I realize that some of us have more resources than others. Some of us have more options than each other. Some of us are safer to do that than others, et cetera. But for me, the priority was the student success. And no, I wasn't always successful at all. The other thing is that I would say is that, which might be a function of age also, I've gotten more practiced at trying to see somebody else's perspective. Like there are people that I just fundamentally am on a different ideological perspective. I, I do not agree with them ideologically. It doesn't make them evil. I don't agree. Now, there are some people that I don't agree with either. At all, but, but it doesn't make them evil because they think differently than I do, right? So I try to have this per perspective of openness, but I do not create false equivalencies. Well, on the one hand, they said the Holocaust was bad. On the other hand, they said, you know, well, you know, it wasn't, you know, when that, you know, what I mean, th th those kind of false equivalencies. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. This is good. All right, so um, one of the things that you mentioned earlier, you talked about uh, Bonilla Silva's work that yes. talks about, um, you know, people wanting to minimize, right? That's one of those strategies that people use. Well, that brings us to one of our questions. And uh, it is, how would you respond to faculty who say that they support our equity efforts in general, but they feel that the college is going overboard and exaggerating the degree of racism that exists at our college and in our culture. In other words, how do you work and engage with faculty or even deans and other managers who minimize or deny the existence and impact of continued racism? And then the second part is really key too. Do your strategies for engaging those who minimize or deny the problem change if they are BIPAC individuals who are doing the minimization? And I know this is kind of hard because this was your whole this was your whole presentation, right? So it's sure, like we could sure. just watch the presentation, you know, but maybe more, you know, any other tip. Yeah. So you know what you're asking, you know, what we're asking, at least from my perspective, is you know, how do you deal with so for an example, someone who uh, denies science? Now I'm not suggesting that if you deny racism, that that's the same as denying science. I'm saying there is indisputable evidence, there is indisputable history, there are indisputable constructs, and you have the data, the empirical data, the outcomes that show it. And if you still don't believe it, I, I don't know that anything I do or say is going to change that. I don't know that anything I do or say is going to change that, because in some ways, it is a convenient form of ignorance, you know, in some ways, people fundamentally just don't believe it. They just they just do not believe it. Right. You know, and I, I don't know. I don't know that I can change that. So what I try to do is to try to make sure I stick with what we say as an institution that we are going to use. We're going to be evidence based. Let's use the evidence. We're going to we're going to ground it in, in data. Let's ground it in data. Uh, 
So I, I don't need to convince you that there is racism. And when someone says, well, this is just going too far, et cetera, that is an example of, you know, this, that's because it is upsetting the status quo. And it also is making people uncomfortable because you have to remember that most of the people that you're talking to have, ha that when, when I had the students imagine that they are racially comfortable 24 seven, they're in environments where they're racially comfortable. Go to the grocery store, go to the bank, go to go, go, go wherever, go to work, go home, go to church, go to wherever you are. They're racially comfortable. And so when you come to this institution and you're having these conversations about inequity, that can be uncomfortable. So, you know, I'm not trying to deny that reality. That is uncomfortable. So you make resources available to address that discomfort, to, to answer those kinds of questions, to give people space to have that discomfort without having to worry about whether somebody thinks that they're racist or not. Form learning communities and support networks. I have a, a colleague who formed a, a, a white allies a group so that you know white people could get together and talk about how to do things beyond putting sign in the in their yard. And it was you know supported by you know mental health professionals and you know race scholars and that type of stuff. But you know, they were, they were doing conscious work. In other words, work that you do on a regular basis when you're trying to understand something and get to know something and piece out, you know, some of the, of the, the puzzles of society. I love that. I love that. Because yeah, we call I'm, I'm not going to change your mind. Right, right. Because if, if I could, could. Yeah, I'm sorry, Mick. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, Dr. Stewart. If I could change your mind, I'd have charged a whole lot more money. I'm just saying, I, but I can't change your mind. <laughs> that is too funny. Okay, now, well, what about students? So what are the best ways to deal with students who resist or become defensive in class when racism is discussed? It doesn't happen often, but when it does, the entire class meeting can be derailed and it can be really demoralizing for faculty and students alike. Yeah, and that is, that's very hard for faculty. That's why the racial literacy is very important so that they understand some of the ways in which they control or, or, or influence and control the classroom to create a learning experience. Students who are struggling when racism is discussed and they're struggling that, you know, the classroom is the space where you explore ideas that are just not necessarily your own. Otherwise, you don't need to be there, right? So, so I, I do get that uh, somebody is, uh, that's, that students may be upset uh, and they get they get supported by organizations and stuff that you know intentionally disrupt in some in some ways or that justify and validate that that discomfort. And so again, it is about you know kind of the racial literacy. And quite frankly, many of us are not equipped to deal with that. So the the kinds of professional development that we have to do is to get us ready for those what if situations. And if you stick with you know, respecting the individual mm -hmm. and that they have the right, they have the right to have their own perspective, to think differently than I do, no matter how wrong they are, as I say, <laughs> they have the right to think differently than I do, then you're in good shape. You know, mm -hmm. part of what you're, you're talking about is us being fearful that you're going to get it wrong and then they're going to go to the dean and then they're going to say they said so-and-so, it's going to be taken out of context and all of that types of stuff. But if you're not examining some of the most, you know, complex constructs and uh, phenomena, uh, as they say, uh, of the last several centuries in your class, then you may be missing some opportunities for some very deep learning. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Now, one of the things that I heard you say, and this is good because we had a question about it. You were talking about how all students do better when we have a diverse faculty, right? Not just our, 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 um, our black students. So one narrative about DASA work, now at our college, we use the acronym DASA, diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice, and anti-racism and other isms. So one narrative about DASA work at the institutional level within hiring and recruitment is that there's just not a critical mass of job applicants from historically marginalized communities. What successful approaches have you seen institutions take to address the historical inequities in employee recruitment, hiring, onboarding, and promotion? And I, I'm glad that we had this question because 
I know that you, you, this is where you made that line where you said that when you put a hold on the hiring and then you talked about the cooked rabbit and the, and the and fatal attraction. And I was like, oh my goodness. So I cannot wait to hear what you have to say here because I, I fell out on that. <laughs> so, so there are lots of different things that we can do. First of all, you don't need the critical mass. You need people to just apply. And they do apply right now. You ask it, every time I would make a hire, I would ask the question, how many people applied? They tell me 112 people applied for this English people, English position. And how many people did you screen? You know, well, we screened in 18 positions. And then how many of them did you invite to, um, to come to an interview? And I'm not just asking how many, I wanted to segregate it by race. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when I get that, then I ask questions around, and when you invited them uh, to, to interview, what, what and, and you interviewed them and you forwarded me the finalists, what was the difference between number three who got to me and number four who didn't get to me? Mm -hmm. And if you, give, if you give me something like, well, you know, there was just a widespread of points. Those points aren't real. Okay, that's not, that's not real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In other words, have an iterative you know, process and, and have a discussion and figure out who is likely to be a good faculty member or a good administrator or a good professional, classified professional for our institution. So that's one. Mm -hmm. Have some consciousness around your own implicit biases. Get trained. The institution needs to make sure you're, you're trained. And I don't mean sending you, having you watch the automatic online slide thing that you can't go through more than two hours. Otherwise, it won't let you go forward. And then you get the certificate at the end that says you have been trained in implicit bias. No, you haven't. All right. Get real training and be have some awareness around your implicit biases. So that not that you're gonna, you know, change necessarily, but that you have that awareness so that you 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 correct for that bias. You ask yourself questions. Am I just thinking this because, you know, if I, you know, it, I'm wondering what's influencing that, that, what's making me think that way. That's one. Look at your job descriptions. If your job descriptions don't start with that, this is the place you wanna be. We are committed to equity, and we have, you know, in other words, some very explicit language mm -hmm. that says, people of color, this is where you want to be. Yes. Look at your images that you put out there. I did, I gave an address to a college and it was about black students and it was about black history month. And I ended up having to go to uh, an HBCU website in order to get pictures of black students because there wasn't in all of the internet, there wasn't a single depiction of a black student. Mm. That is, so why on earth would anybody want to come there? And by the way, I did look at the faculty. I, the cool thing about um, this college is that you can see all of the faculty. Uh, they have their pictures that are done. And, you know, so I'll talk to you guys about, you know, how many, the gender <laughs> makeup of your faculty. But, you know, it's a pretty, it's a pretty homogenous faculty, right? So think about the, you know, think about the, the candidate that's think about the candidate that's meeting that institution and Ooh, figuring right. out whether that's where they want to be. Right. Right? right. The other thing I will say is hire the ones that get to you. Mm -hmm. You know, there are there are people that show up in your processes. Um, so so hire the ones that meet the qualifications. You if you hire a diverse faculty and staff, you will hire the best. Mm -hmm. You will hire the best faculty and staff writ large if they're diverse. If, they're, if you don't have a diverse faculty and staff, you are missing out on the talents and the creations and the contributions that people have that you may not know how to recognize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Set the expectations. I let people know that when you come into the second level, these are the kind of candidates that are likely to be successful. Ask questions that get to their real racial and cultural literacy. Uh, because we tend to have the token diversity question. But the reality is that that diversity question and social justice and equity question needs to be in every question. So when I'm talking to you about your teaching, for an example, if you say to me that, you know, I've been a faculty member for 18 years, I've worked all over these institutions and stuff, I'm interested in this tenure track position. And I ask you, tell me about your success rates and disaggregate it by race. If you can't do that, you spent 18 years, that means you haven't had the intellectual curiosity to see how you're doing with the students that are before you. And in the California Community College, the majority of the people, the students 
of color who are in higher education or in California community colleges. So we don't have the luxury of not knowing. And you know what? The other thing is in terms of leadership, as I said, it's not related to the content of the melanin in your skin. I, you know, I did my whole diversity thing and I remember I had a faculty member candidate that came to me. She was from, first of all, she was from Iowa. I didn't know, I didn't even know real people were in Iowa. It was an imaginary state when I was growing up, you know. You know, all of those, you know, Montana, South Dakota, North Dakota, those were imaginary states to us, right? So she was from Iowa. Uh, red hair, freckled young woman that came in and blew us away with her scholarship and her commitment to social justice and equity and the work that she was doing. And so the, that was a candidate that I wanted on the faculty. It didn't matter that she had less melanin than I did, right? So it's not necessarily based on that. You will have a diversity. But just, you know, I, I understood when I was making, when I was making those decisions of exactly what I was working on. And guess what? When we did, when we finished that hiring process and revamping it and all of that kind of stuff, you know, 67% of the people that are hired were people of color. Uh, and it was a phenomenal set of faculty. Mm. Phenomenal set of faculty. We had, I had young African-American men came in because there were no African-American male faculty in the history of the institution in math, in math. He came in and students who were not being successful, he's taught statistics and used the context of the Flint, Michigan water. Yes. Mm -hmm. And made it relevant to their lives, to, to what they cared about. The, the success rates of that class were just out of this world. It was just off the, it was just over the moon. Uh, and this was just a young brother that came in, you know, you know, his name was Kenyatta. <laughs> came in and, and turned math around as an experience for students of color, but not just for students of color, for every student that was in that classroom, including the white students. Awesome, awesome. Well, that, um, my little buzzer that went off, that was my telling me that that was our time up, but that was just amazing. I thank you so much. And um, I think Clarence wants to take it back. Uh, Professor Banks wants to take it back and, um, well, you know. Well I, well, well, I wanted to say this. I, I do have, I think I have a student question that I think needs to be asked. And I'd love for Dr. Stanback Stroud to be able to address that. And I think if it's okay with you, maybe we can do maybe another five, five or so minutes uh, of extra questions. But I have a student leader that uh, we have an opportunity of showing this in our center here. And uh, one of our student leaders had to go, uh, but she, she definitely passed this question on. And I think it's worthy of being asked. Uh, she said, as a student trying to incite radical change through pandemic and endemic, you know, era learning and seclusion, I run into a lot of issues with anything that's, that disrupts the status quo. Mm -hmm. How do I engage individuals during the time uh, where campuses are at half capacity, most of the students are not in person, um, and fewer resources uh, than, than maybe some of my counterparts. How do I, how do, I do that in this type of environment? Yes, so, so the first thing I would advise um, the student um, is I would advise the students that they're ex asking exactly the right question and they don't have to figure that out by themselves. As a matter of fact, it is the responsibility of that institution in order for to make sure that students have the opportunity to engage. So if you know the students are away, you know that the people are not there, half, you know, the, the many of the people are, are not on campus, et cetera, then what are you putting into place so that students can connect and remain engaged? In other words, this is not a student problem. This is an institutional problem to be addressed. Okay, that's the, the first thing. And then the second thing I would say to the student is of the places that you can engage, the truth is you have access to just about every aspect of the institution. Show up to the president, show up to the vice president, show up to the dean, show up to your faculty members, show up to your colleagues, show up at the admin desk, show up in the financial aid, show up in any of those spaces that you can get into that institution and ask those kinds of questions and do the kind of work that you need to do. And then understand the power of your voice as a student. 
There is nothing more powerful than students coming to a board meeting, just simply making a statement. There is nothing more powerful than a student showing up in my office saying what they need or want or demand or appreciate. Nothing more powerful. It gets your attention, right? So, so the student may not feel that power, but there is power in being a student and, and having a collection or a network in order to be able to use that and give voice to different things. And then understand that institutions work in certain ways. They have certain processes. You know, we might all be gone from campus, but I guarantee you the governance process is still up and running because everybody thinks that they have to have something to say about everything that's done and every decision that's made, right? Get in the middle of those governance processes. Give voice to that. Ask when the college council is. Those are all, these are public things. Ask when the next Senate meeting is. Show up in these meetings. Make sure your ASSC is using the power of that role as well to represent you. Show up at ASC and hold them accountable for representing those views. Outstanding, outstanding. And I think also if I can add to that is that it's also a challenge to all of us that are here on this, uh, at this program in this virtual space to also make sure that we're encouraging our students, those students that have these questions and to make sure that they're not standing alone. Um, that, our, that our job as well is to support those students and encourage those students to, to use their power as students and, and, and to inform them that they have that power uh, to, to make change. I have one more question from, uh, from one of our first year students. Um, and, and I think it's a good question. I, I, think, it's, I think it's a great question. Um, some of which you've touched on. But the question was, how do we work within institutions that were not designed for us? So how do we as black students, you know, 18, 19, 20 year olds, how do we, you know, work within these, these uh, systems that were not designed for us? How do we do that uh, and, and keep our focus and be successful when, you know, because it seems like an insurmountable task to him. How do we do that? Understand, it does feel insurmountable, but I'm going to suggest to you that you just kind of kind of have to imagine that, that if you can't if we can't do that, we might as well just sit down because there is not a system in America that was designed for you. Not a system, not an economic system, not a financial system, not the educational system, not religious structures, not the housing system, not the criminal justice system, not mass media. There is not a system in America that is designed for you. And so, if you have the resignation that you don't know how to work in the system, that, that you can't work in a system that wasn't designed for you, you're gonna miss out on the opportunity to simply live and breathe, right? So the way you work in a system that's not designed for you is to challenge that system, is to show up, is to contribute, to be generous toward that system that says, you, you, we know that you want a better way. You know, the truth is that, you know, there, there are educators right now at these institutions that don't know the answer. They need students to tell them about their lived experiences. They need students to say what they need and want and what will serve them. We need that because it, we don't have a way of getting it. Sometimes, you know, we as educators want to be a fly on the wall just so we can watch and hear and listen and learn to inform our perspective. So assume that you have value and that you have something to contribute and that you deserve the right to make that contribution. Assume that your voice is needed and valued and, and would, would, would change the impact of that institution, would change the trajectory of that institution, and then give that gift to the institution. And that institution then can give you back that gift tenfold. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sandback Shroud. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Stewart, for uh, for facilitating this. Uh, I'm so overjoyed. I I'm letting you know we're gonna have to have to bring you back, and, and we're gonna have to revisit this. As, as someone commented, you know, I believe this is a beginning. So this is not a, this is not an ending. It's not a middle point. I think this is a beginning for us. And so so I think from from all the reactions that I'm getting, not only here but on uh, people text messaging, students uh, opening the door, giving me thumbs up. Uh, I think that this is uh, uh, something that we need to continue in the future. And if you're willing to, to, to come back and work with us, uh, Dr. Standback Shroud, I think we're going to have to find a way to bring you back uh, so that we can continue this conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. It would, be my, it would be my pleasure. Outstanding. Outstanding. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I, I'm actually about to take us to our closing.
So thank you again, Dr. Stan Backstrom. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this concludes our program for today. Uh, we thank all of you for joining us. Uh, once again, the Emoja Aspire program would like to thank Associated Students, the Office of the President, the Board of Trustees, President Dr. Wayne Scroggins, um, the Vice President of Student Services, Dr. Audrey yamagata Noji, Cynthia Parks and the entire technical services team, uh, Yin Mai in the Communications and Marketing Department, our guest speaker, uh, beloved uh, Dr. Regina Stanback Stroud, uh, Dr. Mika Stewart, uh, the Emoja Aspire staff, the entire Emoja Consortium statewide, and all of you in attendance. Now, as we depart, let me leave you with the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. King said, power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. Justice at its best is love correcting everything that stands against love. Let us be those creative dissenters who will call our beloved nation to a higher destiny, to a new plateau of compassion, to a more noble expression of humanness. Let us all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities. And in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation. My name is Clarence Banks, and thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Goodbye.